if we've been most yeah, famous. I don't want to say he's Canada. Canada. Coming to today's session, uh, if you could take your seats, please. My name is Bill Adkinson. I'm an attorney advisor in the Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce the panel on uh, what can U.S. against Microsoft teach about antitrust and two-sided platforms. Uh, we will have uh, people. Uh, uh, collecting cards. If uh, you have questions you want uh, the panelists to consider, please write them out on the cards and uh, pass them to the uh, folks in the aisle who are collecting them. So 20 years ago this past May, the Department of Justice brought its seminal antitrust case against Microsoft, which culminated in a 2001 opinion by the D.C. Circuit and a subsequent consent decree. The case was groundbreaking in many respects. It was the prototype for applying antitrust in dynamic innovation-intensive industries. It raised challenges regarding how antitrust can protect competition and promote incentives for innovation, both by dominant platforms and edge players in the tech sector. Of particular relevance to these hearings, Microsoft's dominant position was a product of indirect network effects. The Windows operating system was a two-sided platform serving applications, developers, and computer users. However, the economic literature on the network effects was in its infancy, uh, as David Evans reported yesterday. Similar antitrust issues are currently arising in the context of a new set of tech sector platforms, such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. As we heard during yesterday's panels, these platforms also pose challenges in applying antitrust in dynamic, rapidly changing industries. Enforcers and courts strive to protect innovation incentives of both platforms and platform participants and evaluate conduct by two-sided platforms and the impact of network effects. This afternoon's extraordinarily distinguished panel will discuss how the benefit of greater economic learning and hindsight can help us better understand aspects of the Microsoft case, and more importantly, how the experience and understanding from the Microsoft case can inform and guide proper antitrust enforcement in this area today. Uh, the panelists will each give opening statements of approximately five minutes each. They are, starting from my right, Professor Daniel Rubenfeld, New York University School of Law and University of California Berkeley School of Law. Professor Douglas Melamed, Stanford University School of Law. Susan Creighton, a partner at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. Professor Randy Picker, University of Chicago Law School. Leah Brannon, a partner at Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton. And Professor Timothy Wu, Columbia University Law School. Dan? Uh, thanks very much, Bill. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, during the time of the Microsoft case, I was the uh, deputy at the Department of Justice in charge of economics. <clears throat> and I spent a good deal of my time, along with a lot of help from a team of lawyers and economists, thinking about the Microsoft case. And uh, I want to try to describe a couple important elements that, uh, that I think are worth uh, reviewing. Uh, first, uh, of course, we were not talking uh, about the world of two-sided markets in those days. Uh, we were talking about pl platform competition, however. Uh, Microsoft, the Microsoft case is about a two-sided market. There are, there are uh, customers both on, on the side of uh, users of uh, the office suite and users of the operating system as, as well as developers for apps. Uh, but the two-sided market doesn't have anything like the characteristics of the two-sided market we see in, with transactions, because uh, there aren't single transactions that affect both sides of the markets at the same time. There are network effects, there are externalities, and there's a kind of feedback loop, but it's not one that has any direct impact. And uh, as I will explain, what I think is important, you'll see that nothing I'm going to say depends on the fact that there is or is not a characterization of a two-sided market. <clears throat> I think that's largely a misleading characterization for purposes of looking at the Microsoft case. What was important to me uh, was network effects. And at the time that I was doing work on this case along with the staff, 
Uh, there was a significant literature in the economics world on network effects. People like uh, my colleagues, Carl Shapiro, Mike Katz, uh, Stanford's Garth Saloner, NYU's Nikki Konamides, and a lot of other people were writing about network effects, but it was new, it was controversial. Uh, that was an important point uh, to develop, and network effects turned out to be an important part of the case. They helped to describe the, the way in which Microsoft uh, uh, maintained its market power in its operating system, and it, it was, in a way, the key to the case, and it was the key to the case because the government believed and developed the, the argument that network effects could generate substantial monopoly power and could lead and support practices that would allow uh, Microsoft to maintain its market power and monopoly power in the operating system market. <clears throat> so the, the uh, key to the case was to develop uh, network effects. And the other thing that was important and essential was to show how network effects drove the uh, important barrier to entry. And the barrier to entry, as most of you would know, was that in order to compete in the operating system market, you had to actually have uh, useful, important uh, applications. Uh, so the entry really occurred two steps. You had to generate an application and an operating system. And that application's barrier to entry became the term that was the norm of the case for us. As far as I know, it was a term never used before the case was filed. And I can tell you by the end of the trial, uh, Microsoft as well as the government was using the, the term every day in the trial. And I think that was really a significant part of the case. Uh, there was a platform argument made in the case. And it is true, I think, that the operating system and the apps upon it can be described as a platform. But the two-sided nature is really not important. What was important was that the platform really supported this monopoly power. Interestingly enough to me, the, the issues about platforms that came up during the case were issues, relevant issues as to whether this market power, substantial market power, really was, was sustainable and significant. And the argument was raised uh, by Microsoft in the case that that monopoly power could be overcome. There would be competition for the market that would be powerful. But what's striking to me, and it turned out to be important in the case as the facts developed, was that it was very hard for Microsoft to specify what that competition was. And for me, one of the really, really striking uh, exhibits in the case was a Microsoft exhibit saying, uh, we face substantial competition from known and unknown sources. And my view is when you have to rely on unknown, unnameable sources to defeat monopoly power, you really have a weak case. And uh, that, that really struck the tone for me. And I will stop and pass to Doug. Uh, I'm going to focus on the, what I think of as the legal implications uh, of the case. Um, the theory was conventional and straightforward. Well, it wasn't conventional in the sense that uh, section, section two had been uh, uh, pretty moribund at that point, but, but it was conventional in the sense that it was entirely consistent with longstanding section two uh, principles. Uh, the theory was basically this. Microsoft had monopoly power in operating systems, P, uh, PC operating systems. That monopoly power was protected by substantial, uh, substantial entry barriers, specifically the indirect network effects uh, uh, and the so-called applications barrier to entry. The point is you need lots of applications in order to have people buy your operating system. You won't have applications until lots of people buy and have already bought the, app, uh, the operating system. There's a chicken and egg problem. That was an entry barrier. OK, Microsoft has, therefore, has a monopoly protected by entry barriers and it engaged in conduct that increased the entry barriers compared to the but-for world. Important point here. The premise of the government's case was not that the entry barrier was impregnable, not that Microsoft would have a monopoly forever, but rather that it had, there were entry barriers, and it was a question of raising the entry barriers compared to the but-for world. Um, OK, how did Microsoft raise the entry barriers? It attacked Netscape and Java, which were two uniquely important potential uh, uh, platform, application platforms, and thus potential facilitators of new operating system entry. Um, uh, the conduct was the kind of conduct that would pass any ordinary test for anti-competitive conduct under the antitrust laws. It was found to serve no efficiency enhancing purpose at all, with one or two minor footnotes that I'm not going to bother with. And thus, the conduct made no sense except as a device to increase entry barriers. 
plaintiff wins. Perfectly straightforward. So what was the controversy about, other than the, the sort of um, uh, importance of going after this exciting new uh, uh, company and uh, the world is the youngest $40 billion person and so forth. Um, and I think it was because the case entailed the application of these very traditional principles in a very new context that had not previously been subject of antitrust scrutiny. So there was the issue of network effects that Dan said, widely discussed among uh, some economists in the literature, hotly contested in the litigation and in the public controversy about it. People actually wrote articles taking issue with the, the story, one of the, one of the fables about the, uh, that was used to tell the story of network effects was the QWERTY type, uh, typewriter keyboard. The notion was it was really inefficient and it was just a first mover advantage that the, that the original developer of the keyboard that was developed for a very different purpose gained. And there were people who went in and said, well, that's not true, that's really not the story of the keyboard, as if that had anything to do with the vitality and importance of the theory. So that was contested, and now we, it's a part of everybody's everyday vocabulary. Uh, the notion that antitrust laws maybe shouldn't apply to dynamic, high-tech industries, Schuperterian competition, winner take all, hotly contested. The court resolved that, now we don't argue about that. Is intellectual property a trump card? because they're, they're protecting their intellectual property rights. Well, the D.C. Circuit said that b argument bordered on the frivolous, so people don't make those arguments anymore. Product design. Part of, an important part of the case was the court's finding that a critical part of the design of the operating system, namely the commingling of operating system and browser code, uh, was anti-competitive. There had been a, a tremendous argument and, and some precursors in the law suggesting that product design is sort of safe harbor from antitrust point of view. Points of view. Um, the most important significance, I think, of the court, uh, of the case, beyond the specific findings of, of that type, uh, are basically this. The court analyzed the facts at a very fine level of granularity. It did not say this is a case about product design, this is a case about intellectual property, this is a case about putting the brow uh, 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 having the browser package with the operating system. It got down to very fine details. It had to do with removing the browser from the ad, from the ad remove utility, thus making it harder for OEMs to distribute uh, other person's browsers at that level of granularity. Um, it is about principles rather than rules. At every, at every point that a party argued that there was a rule of thumb that should decide the case, whether it was the government arguing for a per se tying rule in one of its theories, or defendants arguing exclusive dealing can't be regarded as anti-competitive unless it entails a 30 or 40 percent foreclosure, the court said no, we are not interested in legal rules like that uh, in effect. A key sentence in the opinion, which I happened to read over the weekend when I was preparing for this, it's the following. The court said it is, quote, difficult to formulate categorical antitrust rules absent a particularized analysis of a given market. A caution I wish the Supreme Court in the Amex case <laughs> had more in mind. Okay, just two other things I'll end quickly. Um, causation. Hugely important causation theory. Um, it's interesting that, that Dan said the unknown uh, what, it was kind of a laughable position for uh, Microsoft to point to. But a lot of people used that very argument against the government and said, what's your story? What difference would it have made? It's all speculation. Doing in uh, uh, Netscape, this is just theorizing. Why do we think it's actually going to matter? And the government, of course, didn't have any answer because ne one never knows what innovations would take place in a but-for world. The government's theory was quite different from that. It was that by eliminating these potential facilitators of new entry, they were raising the uh, entry barriers and in a probabilistic sense, reducing the likelihood of new competition. It was a theory available only in a monopoly maintenance case. It wouldn't suffice in a creation of a monopoly case. Um, and it was a theory that by its very terms embraced and depended on concepts of, of Schumpeterian competition. So the big lesson, in my view, from the Microsoft case uh, is not about its particular holdings. It is about the proposition that I, we were all taught first, first day of law school, right? It's all about the facts. 
The antitrust principles were proven to be robust in that case, in part because the court didn't get hung up on, on last year's rule of thumb developed in a different factual context for different problems and rather applied the principles to a careful analysis of the facts. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I neglected to ask the panelists to remove the microphone so they can speak directly into it, please. Thank you. Um, so, so my name is Susan Creighton. I wanted to thank the FTC for the privilege of getting to appear on this panel today. Um, so unlike uh, Dan and Doug, who are kind of authoritative um, about what, what is uh, the Microsoft case mean and that they were, they were uh, critical um, in formulating the case, I, I, was only in, I was involved in the case or in the sort of input phase. I was representing Netscape, um, which was one of the complainants at the time. So um, in five minutes, it's hard to cover all the things that the department got right. Um, Doug, Doug and uh, Dan have mentioned some of them. Um, I, some, of the, some of the points I was going to highlight overlap with some of the points they make. But Doug and I did not um, actually coordinate, but I wanted to, the, the meta thing, I thought that, that you guys got most right um, it, it, and, and drives a lot of the, the rest of the analysis is, the, is clearly the department took the time to actually look at what the evidence was, was showing regarding the nature of competition in the operating system market. And what it showed, I think, was that while browsers were a complement to Windows for users, they were a th potential threat to Windows for application developers. So the browser was a potential competitor as an applications platform. And then trying to, j rather than take the, that simple fact pattern and then try to jam it into some ex pre existing set of boxes like leveraging, the department actually uh, let, let follow the evidence where it uh, led and reached a number of conclusions that I think have remained foundational for how we should think about platforms 20 years later. Let me highlight just four. First, um, DOJ recognized that products that may have the potential to compete even if they don't look like each other. I think that's really important because even to this day, regulators can find it a challenge to recognize that companies may be actual or potential competitors even if they look different, or if in some respects they're complements. Um, that tendency to narrow the set of competitors only to those that just look the same can result in under-enforcement or over-enforcement, Microsoft itself being a great example of how if you had just looked at saying, do browsers compete with, when, with operating systems, the answer is obviously no, end of case. Second, um, as, as both Dan and Doug, I think, have mentioned, um, the department recognized that the key to operating system competition was the indirect network effects between users and app developers. So the OEMs and ISPs were important distribution channels, but the key dynamic by which operating system platforms competed was by the number of applications written for the OS, which in turn depended on attracting users on one side and app developers on the other. The third feature, I think, um, that was really critical was that they focused on platform competition as a horizontal rather than vertical problem. So internet browsers were a threat not because they were a profitable complement. They were very simple pieces of software that eventually everyone gave away for free. Rather, Microsoft itself recognized that browsers in Java threatened to make it much easier for app developers to write across platforms without having to engage in the cumbersome ports from one OS to another that were characteristic then. And that multi-platform access, in turn, would make it much easier for users to switch devices and thus operating systems. Think about how much easier it is to switch devices, for example, if you're streaming music rather than trying to port your music downloads from one device to another. Finally, the, the DOJ recognized that platforms were dynamic, as Doug mentioned, so they needed to understand which business practices were problematic without chilling those that were not. In the process, they advocated for a test that asked whether Microsoft's conduct would make business sense but for its tendency to exclude rivals. Although I'm not sure that this test is always and everywhere the best one, um, it works well in distinguishing between pro-competitive innovation and anti-competitive conduct when dealing with dynamic, innovative markets. It thus enabled the government and ultimately the court to distinguish, for example, between bundling IE with Windows at no charge, which was permissible, versus implementing restrictions that had no possible benefit to any platform participant and served only to make it difficult to load rival software on the machine and hence for users to multi-home. 
Now, the court did not agree with the department on all things, but the department's analysis laid the basis for it to be affirmed on all of its key points. First, the court didn't adopt the department's no business sense test, but it did strike down product design changes that serve no legitimate purpose and for which Microsoft did not show a plausible competitive justification. On the other hand, it permitted those for which Microsoft did offer a legitimate benefit. The court took the department one better in its horizontal analysis by rejecting a section one tying approach to product integration given the ubiquity of bundling on software platforms and the plausible pro-competitive benefits of such integration. And finally, the court affirmed the department's key insights regarding the nature of OS platform competition for users and developers and the threat the cross-platform switching posed to Microsoft's market power. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm Randy Picker. I'm a professor at the Chicago Law School. Um, so I'll, I'll note, as everyone I assume saw, that Paul Allen died yesterday. Um, um, uh, the Microsoft story is a, is a great story, and Paul Allen was so central to it, so I'm sorry to see him gone. Um, when, I, when I teach the Microsoft case in my antitrust class, I, I start with the Internet Tidal Wave memo which is the memo, it was Government Exhibit 20 in the case. Um, it's, it, it's really Gates at his best in the sense that he is looking forward in the industry, um, seeing where it is right now and where he thinks it's going to go. And I think he makes two critical points there. So I thought what Dan said about, um, it's not, you know, we don't need to talk about two-sided markets. That may be fine. Uh, Gates obviously understood powerfully the interaction between what was going on on the developer side and what that meant for the consumer side. So his first point is, he says, look, Netscape's got a 70% usage share, and what they are doing is, as he puts it, is they are moving key API, the application's programming interface, into this middleware layer. And the great risk to Microsoft there is, is that that will commoditize, his word, the underlying operating system that no one will care what operating system they're using. The question I always ask in class is, what brand of plumbing do you have in your house? Not faucets. We Americans have a peculiar fascination with faucets. I mean, actually, the plumbing, and no one ever knows. It's not that plumbing's unimportant, right? But it's a commodity. OK. So Gates saw that, that Netscape posed this risk of changing where competition was taking place with regard to developers. Uh, and the way in which this browser, sort of this adjacent market, was going to maybe then or in future generations going to directly compete with, with Microsoft in the OS market. That's the story the government told. I think that was exactly the right story, but that's what Gates saw as well. The second thing he says is, and this is this where Dan talks about these unknowns, Gates says, oh, some people are talking about this really frightening, is his word, possibility, where someone will come up with a kind of device uh, that you can use to browse the internet. It'll be a lot cheaper than a PC, and you won't need the Microsoft operating system. It is really hard to imagine what that world might look like, right? So other than today, right? So, so Gates understood exactly what was going to happen and saw that and the threat that that posed. It's not that I think, I don't know what, Gate, what Microsoft's current market share is on PCs. I suspect it's pretty high still. What's happened to Microsoft is not that somehow their position has been lost in PCs, but rather this whole other world of computing devices has exploded, and the, the PC is just a, 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 you know, a piece of it, but not the dominant position it was. So Gates saw all that um, and responded to Netscape in a powerful way because of that. Um, uh, the government's case, I mean, we've talked about the success of it. I, I want to hear more about some of the failures. Um, so there was an attempted monopolization claim of the browser market that died. Um, how we think about what an incumbent, a dominant incumbent does with regard to new adjacent markets, I think that's a really important platform issue. And the attempted monopolization claim was in that spirit, so I'd love to hear more from um, uh, what did you say they were, that they were the definitive sources uh, <laughs> on that. Uh, and then obviously the tying claim. Uh, which again relates to this question of to what extent are we going to constrain an incumbent into moving into these adjacent markets. Um, that case, that, that issue got dropped on remand and, and I thought that was exactly the right strategic choice. Uh, but from a standpoint of knowing what the law is, that remains a little frustrating. 
I, I think the question we should ask today is, now with the benefit of all of this development of two-sided markets, um, is to ask, well, if we bring that analysis to bear on the Microsoft case, do we get any different insights into the behavior that we saw there, right? So, so when you teach two-sided markets in class, I have this very simple sort of uh, example of why pricing below marginal cost might be very sensible in two-sided markets. We don't usually allow that in one-sided markets. You build that up, and what you're trying to convince, convey to students is, is that you can't just apply your single market intuitions to two-sided markets. You've got to be more sophisticated about it. So go back and ask the questions, if we look at what Microsoft did through a two-sided market lens, does it look any different? I think the answer to that is sort of no. I thought what Doug said was right, which is the granularity with which the case was presented and which the DC Circuit found compelling. Um, I talk about ad remove in class two. Uh, uh, you know, the commingling of code, the embedding of the IE icon. Microsoft didn't offer a pro-competitive justification for any of those. And I think even in a world of two-sided markets, it would struggle to do that now. Oh, I'm out of time, so I should stop. Um, I, I, I do think, you know, the bolder story would be to argue if you're Microsoft back then as to why fragmentation in these markets would be bad. That's what Google has tried to do unsuccessfully in Android. And I think if you made those arguments in a two-sided market, maybe you'd be able to to try to bolster their position. I think ultimately those are losers. Uh, but that's the direction I would want to go, I think. Uh, but I do think it's, I think it's interesting to relook at what they did. Um, ask what could they have done had they simply tied and not engaged in all these other silly behaviors? Uh, what would the case have looked like and how would we see that through a two-sided framework? Hi, I'm Leah Brannan. I want to thank Bill and the FTC for inviting me to join this panel. At the time of the Microsoft case, I clerked for Judge Ginsburg on the DC Circuit. Um, so I'm really excited that we're here talking about the case 17 years later, that it's held up pretty well over time. Um, it's been cited, I uh, checked on Westlaw the other day, it's been cited more than 1,500 times in cases and law review articles, including twice by the Supreme Court in Trinco and Linkline. Uh, more than 100 times by the federal courts of appeals, around 300 times um, by the district courts, and 1,200 law review articles. So it's, it's been cited many times. I like to think that's because it was groundbreaking, but it's probably also because it was just a really long opinion. <laughs> and it covered a lot of topics. So um, as you probably all know, the opinion touched on monopoly power, the standard for monopolization, licensing restrictions as an act of monopolization, predatory product design, um, exclusive dealing, deception, attempted monopolization, tying, course of conduct, causation, um, and that's just the antitrust discussion. It actually gets cited. A lot of those citations are for the uh, judicial misconduct section, which was a, an odd sideshow part of the case. Um, I think, you know, my opinion is that one of the most important contributions of the case was the court's decision to apply the rule of reason, just the basic rule of reason to monopolization claims. Um, there were other standards, I think Susan touched on this, and Doug, there were other standards floating around at the time. Um, even in connection with Microsoft, a couple of years earlier, Judge Williams in the consent decree case had written an opinion um, basically indicating that if the defendant has any pro-competitive effect from its conduct, no matter how small, that immunizes all of its conduct. So that was one possible standard. Uh, there was also the test the government was pushing that Susan called the, the business sense, you know, does something, does conduct make no economic sense but for a tendency to monopolize. So there were a lot of other standards and the court um, adopted and applied the rule of reason. So I'll turn it over to Tim. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, get in front of the microphone. Uh, I, uh, Tim Wu, and I want to thank Bill and also the FTC. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my involvement in the actual Microsoft case was somewhat uh, tangential. I was a research assistant for Larry Lessig uh, right when he became the special master, and then later was a clerk for Dick Posner right about when he, so if anyone remembers this strange chapter when all these guys uh, got involved. Uh, but of course, that all amounted to nothing, and so <laughs> uh, that was that. Um, I uh, uh, have studied, uh, actually maybe more important, is I was uh, working in Silicon Valley when, when the decision came down, and that, that's what I, I think is, um, 
uh, and, and felt some of the after effects. And, and that's what I want to focus on in my comments here. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there are many lessons from Microsoft, um, uh, but I think it teaches us something very important about enforcement policy in particular, and the, um, essentially the, the courage and the uh, determination and the, uh, as was already described, um, the great care with which the, the government brought its case is, I think, an important model for, for, this, for the agency, for FTC, for the Justice Department, for anyone uh, who's serious about enforcement of the antitrust laws. <clears throat> you know, to make the point obvious, the uh, antitrust laws don't have any effect unless they're enforced, and uh, they go through periods of, of, of great uh, quiet and calm um, with, when, uh, uh, when enforcement uh, uh, doesn't happen. Uh, you know, in the very beginning of the law's uh, passage, it wasn't seriously enforced in, uh, in, uh, for almost a decade. And so it always takes, uh, you know, a certain, uh, I, I'd say, courage uh, to, to bring these cases. Uh, I think it's worth remembering that the Microsoft case, I, I happen to think it was antitrust at uh, one of its finest hours, maybe along with AT&T, and I, I think other people have said that. But at the time, there was enormous resistance to the idea of bringing this case. Uh, uh, Doug already highlighted some of the reasons. People said it's a new and dynamic industry. Uh, you know, someone else will come along and swallow Microsoft in, in 10 minutes. Um, uh, there was also, and I want to emphasize this, a no really clear price effects for what they were doing. Um, Explorer was be giving, being given away for free. You know, Microsoft was like a charity, giving this new product to everybody. Um, you know, so why would, you, why would anyone argue with that? Bill Gates was kind of a darling at the time, a symbol of American uh, entrepreneurship. And so it, it, it required sailing into the headwinds uh, to some degree to bring this case, and I, I think that was uh, an act of courage. And I think the lesson uh, for today's enforcers is, uh, uh, is that they need to... Um, have, have the courage and uh, also have the, uh, let, let me make three particular points about this, uh, have the courage to take cases in these kind of uh, situations. So uh, here are the, the three things I think are particularly important. Uh, one uh, is the, the fact that Microsoft was brought without clear, at least as far as I know, clear evidence of, of price effects. So, you know, there wasn't uh, obvious uh, that uh, the campaign against Netscape was actually inflating prices to consumers. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, the case was brought, you know, had to be brought in this more uh, complex theory that, in fact, it was, uh, uh, that it was affecting competition uh, for the platform uh, and uh, was monopoly maintenance. And so, you know, and that, that took a certain, I think we've, um, in subsequent years, sometimes been too nervous, uh, uh, unwilling to bring cases when we don't have a clear price effect, and it's worth going back to Microsoft to, to notice that even if a product is being given away for free, that does, doesn't necessarily tell us the whole story. Um, second, and related to that, is uh, the observation, everyone knows this, is that you know, the greatest uh, benefits uh, for successful antitrust enforcement have to do with dynamic benefits, uh, uh, with uh, innovation effects, uh, for example. And that may mean the beneficiaries may be unknown, in fact, and, and not obvious. Uh, this is my second point. So when you look at uh, the aftermath of, of Microsoft, actually, it didn't really help out Netscape very well. Mike, Netscape uh, uh, plunged in, in market share. Uh, Explorer did, in fact, gain a monopoly. It was at something like 95 percent in, in 2002 or so. Uh, so you know, it wasn't, I mean, Netscape became Mozilla and so forth. but. It didn't exactly uh, uh, save that company. The real beneficiaries at the time, when you look back, were the companies that were beginning and starting to make, uh, to, to view the web as a, as a development platform, to try to make their fortunes on top of the HTML protocol uh, and on the internet. In other words, the great beneficiaries are really Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and some other uh, companies who might have been in a very different situation with an unpoliced browser. And um, I think, uh, you know, I don't think uh, maybe, they, I think people were thinking about that in abstract terms, but Google was like a college project when the, or a grad school project when the, when the, uh, uh, when the case was begun. So it was impossible to, to realize some of the value that might be created, but required the sort of, uh, sort of uh, faith and not just faith, but some um, ability to realize that the dynamic benefits might be the most. I realize I'm out of time, so I'll just say my third point. The last lesson, I think, uh, for enforcers, or frankly, innovation policy, 
uh, from Microsoft, I think, is taking a careful effect, a careful look at the effect of what I call the policeman at the elbow for uh, the conduct of a monopolist. You know, many people have noticed, sometimes said, well, you know, no one, they didn't break up Microsoft, it kept a monopoly. Um, but one of the most, I really think the most important effects, as I've suggested, was the fact that Microsoft, after the suit was chastened, uh, and operated with a policeman at the elbow, and therefore never did some of the most obvious moves they could have on, on an unregulated browser, uh, such as making sure, for example, that their search engine was the default and was impossible to remove, or any of the other things you might have done with an un completely unsupervised browser. So I've used up my five minutes, but those are some of the things I thought. Great. I want to thank the panelists for keeping it on time. That was a great job. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Derek Moore, for having thought of this uh, topic for a panel. Uh, he deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, I'm going to be set out uh, various uh, groups of questions and, uh, in the hope that I'll el elicit some responses. Uh, the first set will broadly cover issues surrounding liability under Section 2, uh, exclusionary conduct, incentives to innovate, and harm to competition. The Microsoft Court identified the application's barrier to entry as the central source of Microsoft's market power, and the government asserted that Microsoft illegally maintained the operating system monopoly by protecting this barrier from nascent competition from the Net Netscape browser. Among other things, the government alleged that Microsoft undermined the competitive threat posed by Netscape by technologically tying its browser to Windows and by placing restrictions on distribution of competing browsers. The Court of Appeals upheld the district court's finding that Microsoft's conduct illegally maintained its Windows monopoly, while noting the difficulty of assessing the extent to which that monopoly would have been eroded absent Microsoft's exclusionary conduct. The government also claimed that this conduct constituted an illegal attempt to monopolize the browser market, but the Court of Appeals overturned the district court's finding of such a violation. With that background, let's first talk about innovation incentives. How important to the government's case were concerns that Microsoft's exclusionary conduct, particularly toward browsers, would reduce incentives by small industry players to innovate? What light does Microsoft shed on the current concerns that incentives to innovate at the edge are undermined by fears that a dominant platform can use its position to discriminate against or otherwise exclude competitors in related markets? Uh, and Dan and Tim, you could start us off, please. Sure, thanks, uh, uh, it's a great question. So uh, for me, uh, uh, the characterization of the case as an innovation case would be accurate. What motivated me, and I believe the, the case was the concern that, uh, that absent uh, some of the practices that we've been talking about, uh, there would have been a substantial innovation. But as Doug pointed out, it's very hard to say exactly what the future will be in a, in a highly uh, rapidly changing uh, world. So the innovation case was pushed through by talking uh, really in an ex ante point of view about the likelihood or probabilities of various things occurring. And uh, for, me, uh, for me, the story we would tell about innovation was, was to say, suppose we're in a world where where Java was successful, Java carried by uh, Java software carried by Netscape and maybe other browsers at a different point in time, <coughs> would allow competitors to to compete both by uh, finding alternative operating systems uh, that were not uh, Windows based and and the apps to support it. Now, <coughs> why why is this harmful to innovation? Well, <coughs> we know from an economics point of view that. If you've got a large installed base, it makes good sense when you're innovating to, to innovate to protect that installed base. And the installed base was generating billions of dollars of revenue for Microsoft, and it was pretty clear that, that much of the innovation was directed in that, in that uh, direction. So it's not that Microsoft wasn't innovating, and in fact continued to improve Internet Explorer during the period we were looking at, but the innovations were directed to protect rather than to grow and take on these new unknown sources that I talked about earlier. Uh, and that is a problem. Now, the reason why the problem for me became really striking was that during the investigation period, <clears throat> at the behest of my boss, Joel Klein, I made a number <coughs> of trips, mostly to Silicon Valley, in which I both publicly gave rather innocuous speeches and privately met secretly with many of the players in the market. 
<clears throat> and during those secret meetings, which were spy-like, by the way, I had to travel incognito and meet in hotels and things of that sort. I never thought when I went to DOJ that I would be going through that process. But what was striking about the meetings was not that everything I heard was true. There were many claims that I decided and we decided were invalid. But what was, was striking was that they were secret. The, the firms that thought they wanted to enter into the market to compete with some of the products, either direct products that Microsoft generated or ones that they might be in markets where they would be competing, those firms were afraid to publicly even talk about their concern. Uh, I think there's a strong indication to me, there was to me, that the fact uh, that firms that were likely to be entering small innovative companies were afraid to talk and B, were likely to move their innovations in different directions suggested there was a strong problem. Uh, and, the, and many of those firms later, uh, with a little pulling and tugging, testified at the trial. But I can tell you it took a long effort to get those witnesses become public. And for me, that served as a strong motivation to, 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 uh, to try to develop the argument that ex ante, there was a strong probability that many of these firms would be innovating and we would see a different world had we not acted. Well, it turned out you were right, I think. And um, you know, I, I think uh, what we learn about the, uh, from the case particular in this area uh, is uh, how sensitive, and I, I think that the methods of going to interview people are, are, are a good one, uh, to un of understanding the process of, of innovation uh, on platforms and um, the effects that, ex uh, and the particular uh, techniques of exclusion that you tend to see uh, on, on platforms. Um, you know, I'm interested in the history of, of major, major platforms, ma major tech platforms. And uh, when you look at the history of Microsoft a little bit over a longer period, you see they had sort of developed a, a pattern, which is to say that they you know, um, sought to control the, uh, the platform. Bill, Bill Gates, I think, did have the, the genius that Randy uh, described. He had this incredible ability to see the future and the ambition to want to control it. Uh, so he uh, you know, always sought, since the early dealings with IBM, sought to, saw the platform as, as all important uh, and that invited um, uh, the developers to the platform. Uh, but then had the pattern um, of, uh, of then uh, copying the most successful of the, uh, copying the most successful of those who developed on their platform, and then one way or another ensuring that uh, the Microsoft version of it uh, won. Now that wasn't what the Microsoft case ended up being based upon, but I'm, I'm, and I'm not talking about the antitrust theory, but I am talking about the industry effects. So the, after a while, the, I, I, the industry, I, uh, I believe, began to think of Windows as a, a place where you invited for dinner and ended up being dinner. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a safe place to innovate, and which is why everybody was, was, was uh, jumping over to the web um, as, as an opportunity for, uh, you know, develop uh, uh, freely without Microsoft interference. And so then you had this, you know, whether, whether I, th I think uh, the department did realize it, but there's this crucial moment where uh, Microsoft might have just repeated the pattern, which had repeated on several occasions, gained control of, of the major platform, which by then would be the browser, and used that control to um, see which, uh, first of all, you know, understand which applications were the most successful, and then um, uh, copy them and make sure it it's became dominant, in which case we'd have a future where you know, Bing would uh, operate the general search engine, maybe there'd be some version of Facebook, but it'll all be Microsoft uh, all the way through, and I submit that would be, um, uh, a less, uh, uh, that, that would have been worse for uh, the, the environment, worse for innovation. So uh, I, I only bring this up to say that maybe, since it's the hearing, we're talking about ongoing cases, that's a pattern that we should pay attention to and, and look for. You know, are there currently firms that are trying to control, you know, a, a major platform, that major platform? And are they um, taking some of the Microsoft-like moves uh, to try to uh, make, uh, to open themselves up and then uh, to open up the platform, but then uh, ensure that they control the, the most valuable um, sources of uh, profit on that platform. Susan, did you want to? Uh, yeah, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so just on the uh, anonymity point, um, uh, Dan, you brought to mind that I, that I actually, in connection with the first Microsoft case, the one that led to the consent order, ended up filing a brief on behalf of three anonymous amici, um, which, uh, I think is uh, one would have to look whether or not there's ever been anonymous uh, commenters to, <laughs> to a Tony Eck proceeding before or after. It seemed it seemed uh, very amusing to everybody in D.C. It was not so funny 
uh, to people in Silicon Valley. Um, and having represented companies down th in Silicon Valley for about 30 years, I, my, my general experience has been that if uh, people are lining up around the door to complain about you, you're probably not the ones you want to worry about. It's the one people putting their bags over their heads that are, are the scarier ones. Um, I, I did want to pick up on a point, Bill, that was, I thought, implicit in your question, which was, I don't actually think that maybe, maybe the department was, but I don't think the court was concerned about intra-platform competition per se. You mentioned edge competitors, if, if that was what you were referring to, or at least I, I, it seemed to me that what the court was really focused on was preserving inter-platform competition, the horizontal point I, I made earlier, um, it, it, in the notion that, that what would preserve competition on, on top of the platform was that kind of inter-platform competition. And I think um, that's certainly what we see today, if you consider, you know, so for those of you who were here when uh, Catherine Tucker spoke yesterday, she was talking about the competition between Uber and Lyft, for example, that's a competition that's taking place on, on top of the, the platforms. And you see intense competition on both the driver side and the user side, which she had pointed out. And that, that intense competition in turn is facilitated by the fact that it's so easy to switch and multi-home and why is it so easy to switch in multi-home? It's because on both sides of, the, of, of that app platform or app you know, service, um, they run across so many different devices that no device maker or operating system platform really could try to lock them down um, on, on either side. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that, that it, it's the inter-platform competition that gives us that freedom for, for this sort of re results in that vigorous in, in, you know, sort of competition on top of the platform as well. Um, but uh, you know, a, a further point, and I, I mentioned this in my opening remarks, but wanted to emphasize it was, um, I think for, for, for you to get that kind of robust inter-platform competition, platforms do have to be able to innovate. And that that innovation historically has taken the form of integrating previously separate functions. So as, you know, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the DC Circuit expressly rejected the application of per se tying rules to software platform markets on the ground that productive integration was a common feature in competitive software markets and companies often competed by gaining a first mover advantage by being the first to integrate what had been to previously two separate functions. So the court concluded that quote, this ubiquity of bundling in competitive platform software markets should give courts reason to pause before condemning such behavior even in less competitive markets such as desktop OSs. So I think, I think that the court was exactly right in its focus and in, if we're gonna apply kind of what the world might have looked like if the court had reached a different conclusion, let's say um, they had, had not uh, ruled that way, people sometimes can forget that what happened after browsers or, is there actually was then the next sort of round of vigorous competition that was taking place really right as the Court of Appeals decision came down was between um, online portals, right? So there was vigorous competition amongst AOL, which was perceived as dominant with MSN um, and Yahoo, um, really kind of from really late 1990s up through the mid 2000s. And all during that time, they were vigorously integrating new features. They were adding travel, messaging, search. If the DC Circuit's decision had come out differently, might those platforms have been sued for unlawful leveraging into edge services? And making that assessment, how would we know where true portal services left off and vertical services began? So we know in retrospect that that platform, vigorous co platform competition amongst the portals actually ended up greatly accelerating competition in edge services. So Expedia was founded as part of MSN and that was spun off separately. You know, I think Tim mentioned, you know, Google, Facebook. A lot of those companies got start in, as point providers in, in providing apps, if you wanted to call it that, that had, where there clearly the consumer demand had been surfaced by this inter-platform competition among the portals. So I think the DC Circuit was right to let that portal competition thrive. Um, and the evidence was that that, that in turn was what really enabled um, com com competition uh, to take off from there. Jacob. Yeah, let me just add a brief thought. Uh, I agree with everything that, that Susan said. So I just want to add this in the, in the spirit of uh, let's not forget the lessons we learned uh, in, in the Microsoft case. So at the, 
at the time of the Microsoft case, there was a tremendous kind of chorus of, of people who were uh, concerned about the case, um, thought it was misguided or, or, or paid to say that, I'm not sure which, um, uh, who were saying, oh, gee, if you do this, you're going to interfere with the ability of Microsoft and firms like Microsoft to innovate. You're second-guessing their product design. You're second-guessing their innovation path uh, and so forth. A, a legitimate concern, to be sure. What was striking is that the government ex re responded quite explicitly by saying the issue is not what set of rules will uh, enable uh, Microsoft to maximize its innovation, but what set of rules will enable the market to be most likely to innovate. We were concerned with maximizing market-wide innovation. Um, and I think the court got it right for all the reasons that, that, that Susan said. And I, I know I'm sounding like a Johnny One note here, but by contrast to the Amex case, uh, where the um, vi uh, alleged victims of the wrongdoing, Discover, Visa, and MasterCard, didn't pay much, uh, the court didn't pay attention to them. The court just focused on the defendant. Thanks. Is, is Susan, let me just uh, uh, have one follow-up. Mm -hmm. Susan correctly distinguished between the uh, uh, competition among platforms and uh, as opposed to competition with edge players on a platform. Uh, we did, we have he heard a fair amount of complaints. So, so, something like the fear you're talking about in the, uh, about Microsoft uh, back uh, during the building up of the case. Uh, uh, there's fear uh, uh, expressed by edge, edge uh, players that uh, they will not be able to innovate in certain areas. And, uh, but, but it is a different uh, circumstance. I wanted to ask if people wanted to comment directly on, uh, on those sorts of concerns. We, we heard it in the uh, uh, panel on uh, uh, platforms in action yesterday, for example. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, so, and I think part of that goes to what Susan was saying about integration. So when we, when we see a dominant firm entering um, a space where you see someone on the edge who's come in, I, I think the questions you have to ask is, is, is this a failure of antitrust policy? Is this a failure of IP policy or not, not a failure at all? So software patents emerge in the 1960s precisely because IBM at that time was selling everything on a bundled basis. You got the mainframe, you got the services, and you got the software. And people who wanted to enter the software business didn't see a good way for them to, to propertize their innovations. Uh, IBM would imitate it immediately. Uh, antitrust failure, IP failure, the software patent emerges in response to that. Uh, and so I, I think when we see people who say we're not seeing this innovation, one possibility <clears throat> is, is the incumbent's actually incredibly well situated to go into the market and keeping them out of the market would be a mistake. That's one characterization of the 1956 AT&T final judgment where we blocked AT&T from going into computers. The other is, is the people who run the IP regime have said, actually, we want competition to take place there, and you don't get a property right there. And then the question is, what's antitrust supposed to do about that, if anything? I come back, and I, you know, uh, on this, on just on this particular edge, uh, on this edge issue, I, I don't, I wouldn't disagree with Susan at all that uh, inter-platform competition is very important. I'm just n nervous, I think, sometimes that that becomes the only uh, concern in, in, when we talk about policing of innovation platforms. Uh, you know, in some ways, it was an unusual setup, Microsoft, uh, in the sense that you had, a, a, you know, a platform that had an application that itself could become a platform, yes. and that doesn't, yeah. <laughs> not, and if that's the only, th if we just look for that particular, um, I don't know, four, four leaf clover, we, we may overlook uh, problems, that, uh, other types of problems. Microsoft also included an attempted, uh, uh, a, te a second count, or I don't know which count it was, but the uh, attempted monopolization count as well, and that uh, was not, I don't think, in, in, uh, nece uh, necessarily uh, based on a, a purely inter. So I just think we should not overlook the, the challenge of policing uh, where innovation actually happens and the conditions of innovation, I, I would accept the fact that you do have to be very careful about whether integration is actually pro-competitive or not, but the, to say it's, we're only going to look at intercompetitive platform cases, I think, would, would uh, draw the wrong lesson from Microsoft. I guess I would just add maybe to, to one other thought for people is, is the, when, when you first had announced sort of multi-sided platforms and stuff, um, I was actually thinking this was going to cover hardware as well as software. Um, because actually the, 
you know, going back to the IBM peripherals cases, um, the the problem <laughs> of product integration is actually at least as intense in hardware as it is in software. And in, the, in those cases, as many of you know, I'm sure, um, involved stuff like, well, you know, if, if IBM integrates, um, you know, sort of the sort of the disk drive with with the CPU and the and the interface disappears, how are you possibly supposed to compete as a separate disk drive manufacturer? <coughs> You know, and that's a, that's a tough spot to be in if you're a competing disk drive manufacturer. But you know, most people here are not lugging around separate keyboards and disk drives, and you know, so 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 the you know, and and I actually think, as a, probably a point I'm going to make in, in a few minutes, I actually think the problems with um, stickiness and lack of multi-homing and and so forth are actually much harder in hardware than software. Um, and so I think we need to be careful in thinking about as we're concerned about. Well, gee, we need to preserve the importance of complementarity. Um, how would that world look like if we're talking, to, for example, about integrating in hardware as well as software? Because it's hard for me to explain why you'd have one rule for one and not the other. And, and IBM eventually won those cases. Yeah. I mean, they, they've lost sometimes below, but they won on appeal. On the facts. <laughs> on the facts, absolutely. It was uh, just harder to try to put together a panel for those cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And now I'd like to uh, ask to, us to consider uh, aspects of the Microsoft case in hindsight. Uh, first, how might the legal learning in the recent uh, Amex decision have influenced the Court of Appeals if that case had been decided before Microsoft? And uh, Doug, it uh, sounds like you might be interested in that one. <laughs> well, the, the, the alternatives would be not at all or badly. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, Amex is not literally applicable, I suppose, because it purported to be addressing the rules that would apply to a, uh, what it called a two-sided transaction platform, which is one that involves simultaneous transactions between parties on both sides, and I don't think anybody would have said back then or today that Microsoft is facilitating um, uh, simultaneous transactions between uh, 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 purchasers of the operating system on the one hand and apps developers on the other. So one, one I suppose, a facile answer is to say it's not applicable. I do think, though, or worry, though, at least, that the decision could have, a, sort of, could have perversely affected the case um, if it had um, kind of induced the court to get, get all tangled up in the question of, is two-sidedness something that requires a different body of law, a whole different conceptual apparatus? How do we think about this? Um, uh, you know, the, the Lorraine Journal involved a two-sided uh, platform as well, but I think we all agree that the court got it right there without, without getting too bogged down, because these things really have to turn ultimately on the factual inquiry as to whether two-sidedness does or does not matter. Now, in the Microsoft case, Microsoft actually made a two-sided uh, defense. It, it, made, it, 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 well, it made one specific one. Uh, it said, um, uh, we need to integrate the browser into the operating system in the way that we did, and the way the court ultimately found to be anti-competitive, uh, because uh, that will enable us to establish a uniform, stable platform, which will benefit app suppliers on the other side of the platform. The court rejected that on the facts. Now, if Microsoft were right that its platform were, was more efficient as a, in a technological sense for apps writers, then it would have legitimately brought two-sidedness uh, into the conversation. Uh, and it might be you know, a very difficult factual question uh, uh, of how you resolve it. They lost it on the facts. But the broader argument that was implicit in what Microsoft was saying went something like this. I need to strong arm OEMs and others to exclude rivals uh, by conduct that is not otherwise efficient so that I can increase network effects benefits available to writers of apps. Um, and that should fail, it seems to me, as a matter of law, uh, without any worry about two-sided jargons and platforms and any, any fancy uh, hand-waving, for the very simple reason you can't justify anti-competitive conduct on account of the fact it's going to enable you to re realize scale benefits. I think that's kind of been pretty implicit in the National Society of Professional Engineers. Market's supposed to decide uh, the trade-off between scale benefits on the one hand and um, uh, heterogeneity of, of suppliers on the other hand. So I guess what I'm saying is Amex could be dangerous if it unleashed a series of arguments that would say, well, what I'm doing benefits the other side. 
Uh, it is not literally applicable, but at the same time, I think we all have to recognize, just the way we recognize the significance of network effects, that two-sidedness can matter on the facts as a way of explaining in a very genuine way whether the conduct was anti-competitive uh, because inefficient or whether it really was efficiency enhancing. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure if it's not literally applicable. I think it'll be really interesting to see how the courts interpret Amex. Um, the Supreme Court obviously did talk about transaction platforms, but it also said um, that a court needs to consider both sides of a market except when indirect network effects are minor. So I'm not really sure where you'd come out on it. It's a, it'll be interesting to see what, um, what happens with Amex. But I, I think setting that aside, I, I, I think the conduct would be viewed the same way by the DC circuit, even if Amex had been handed down. Obviously, Amex um, applies rule of reason. The DC circuit was a, you know, very aggressive in applying the rule of reason. As Doug mentioned, um, Microsoft did have some justifications that it threw out um, that took into account effects on both sides of the market. So one of them was for the license restrictions that prevented OEMs from altering windows. Um, and one of the things that the OEMs couldn't do was have um, you know, another browser icon or um, present another browser to the user in the boot sequence. And Microsoft argued um, that that would undermine the principal value of Windows as a stable and consistent platform that supports a broad range of applications and is familiar to users. So um, their justification is pointing at both value to apps developers and to consumers. And the DC Circuit was open to that. It considered that argument. And like Doug said, it failed on the facts. The court noted that Microsoft had not substantiated that claim at all. Um, and also noted in passing that um, it was a little bit hard to believe that adding a desktop icon um, was critical because that doesn't affect the code already in the product and does not self-evidently affect either the stability or consistency of the platform. But Microsoft really hadn't attempted to back up that justification. Um, interestingly, Microsoft also put out a justification for one of its, um, Microsoft had designed Windows to override the user's default browser choice in certain scenarios. And one of those um, was when the user moved to the internet through the My Computer or Windows Explorer panes. And Microsoft argued um, that while that might be bad for browser competitors, it was good for users because it helped them move seamlessly from local storage devices to the web in the same browsing window. Um, so they're making a consumer-focused argument, and the DOJ didn't rebut that argument, so Microsoft's argument there was determinative. So I, th I think um, because of the way the court looked at it, it was taking those types of arguments into account. There was also obviously the tying discussion, which we've touched on, where the court very explicitly said it wasn't inclined to apply a per se condemnation of tying um, because courts should only do that after considerable experience with a particular type of conduct. and. Microsoft's technological tying and what it was doing in this case was new, and the court noted that it could have important efficiencies both for third-party developers and for consumers. And um, because of that, it was not appropriate to use the per se rule. The court remanded for the lower court to look at the actual effects of Microsoft's tie. And unfortunately, uh, for I guess the rest of us, um, the case settled, and the um, lower court never got a chance to um, grapple with that. Sure. What uh, I've said previously that I didn't think that uh, things would look very different had we seen the Amex decision before we were investigating Microsoft, and I think that's the case. Uh, but I suspect that uh, if we look to the private side, the story would be different because uh, one of uh, the areas of concern in private litigation, of course, is, the, is what the but-for world would look, look like in terms of pricing. And it's, so it would be natural to ask yourself <coughs> um, how the pricing of the, uh, of the various licenses for the, uh, for the operating system relate if at all, to, to what uh, the developers had to pay to get access to the tools to develop, to develop their software for the operating system. And <clears throat> what strikes me about that is 
Uh, I, even 20 years later, I still dream parts of this case, and I remember, <laughs> I remember the exhibit numbers, Randy, and I, I can cite to you various footnote uh, quotes from Jim Alcian, the, window, the head of Windows, and so on. I have no idea exactly what fee uh, was paid uh, by developers to get access to the tools to develop apps, because that was really irrelevant. It was, I'm sure there was a very small, modest fee. Uh, so it, that would not have, that did certainly not affect my thinking in looking at the case. But I could imagine now <coughs> that in the result of, of the uh, opinion in Amex being unclear as to how focused it is on transaction markets may lead to a lot of discussion about pricing, a good portion of which may turn out to be not very useful. Thanks. I'd like to move to the next uh, a group of questions uh, that were related, uh, basically questions about uh, uh, the extent to which new economic learning may uh, make us uh, view the Microsoft case uh, uh, differently or whether it reinforces our views. Uh, has the literature, uh, the new literature on uh, two-sided network effects either confirmed or contradicted the analysis of the application's barrier to entry in Microsoft? Uh, what about the assessment of switching costs and multi-homing? Uh, is it, was it consistent with what uh, we look at in contemporaneous analysis? Uh, was the, uh, what does it suggest about the importance of indirect network effects as a possible source of market power? And whether in, uh, in assessing whether uh, a dominant platform has violated Section 2, how do we assess whether uh, a nascent uh, competitor could or might have uh, significantly eroded the platform's dominant condition. And I guess the only thing I'd uh, add to that is uh, how is, has technology changed and how has uh, changes in technology assessed that assessment as well? And uh, uh, Susan, did you want to speak to that? Or, uh, sure. I, I can get us started at least. Um, yeah, so I think I, I'm, not, I'm not an economist, so Dan would have to correct me. If, um, but I mean, I think that the subsequent economic literature certainly has conformed the confirm the importance of indirect network effects. Um, what, what I think maybe is a little bit new is, or at least from what I remember of, of what was understood at the time, um, was, is there was an element in the Microsoft executives thinking, um, actually Randy mentioned it, sort of like in the internet tidal wave, um, there was a real, a real key fear about the internet and browsers kind of accessing to the internet um, that made it sort of qualitatively different from like just another OS platform. They, they weren't concerned about it the way they were concerned, would have been concerned about Apple, even if Apple had been more robust or something. And, and I think it was their intuition was, um, Randy's probably read the internet tidal wave memo more recently than I have, but, but that you're gonna detach, you know, I mentioned about sort of hardware or software, this notion that you were going to detach yeah. the software Absolutely. from the hardware, um, and, and that that really was was going to be profound, um, and I, I don't remember seeing that being kind of in, in in the economic literature until I guess more recently. Like I was just you know was reading uh, you know Professor Catherine Tucker's work, for example, recently, and and she was talking about um, I think that's something that she's been emphasizing, and in, in her work more has been. Um, sort of the, 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 a really key com component to how effective um, indirect network effects are uh, is, is how much t they're tied to localized hardware. Um, like, so she gives the example, I think I mentioned earlier, about um, like the iTunes store, um, which she said, you know, when she was teaching, she always used to give us like the classic example of, you know, nobody's ever going to move out of the iTunes store because they have all these, you know, downloads. Um, and then along comes music streaming, and who cares? Um, so, so, you know, so I think the the reason that, you know, sort of often business executives intuit to things that it, it's, it takes us a little bit longer to kind of articulate what, what was that key core fear. I mean, I think if you compare, I mentioned Uber, Lyft, for example, you know, so it's been interesting in the last 18 months. Obviously, Uber's had some PR issues. Um, but despite that, you know, 18 months ago, they had like 80, 20 market share relative to Lyft. And, you know, I was just looking last week and now it's more like 
lift is like at 35 percent, going trending towards 40 percent. You know, that's that's a big shift in a market that you think of as having a lot of indirect network effects in 18 months. You know, and I and I think it's that. I think it's, it's what Professor Tucker was talking about, about, you know, in a purely virtual world, I don't know if we realized, or, or I don't know that's widely recognized, but, I, but it seemed interesting to me that in, if you're completely detached in this virtual environment, that indirect network effects may have, have be less locked in than if you have kind of that, that uh, localization to hardware that Microsoft enjoyed. Doug? So I just want to pick up on something that Susan said, which I thought was interesting. She made the observation, which I think is clearly correct, that sometimes the intuition of business folks is ahead of the, the uh, conceptual abilities or, or experience of, of, of the academic uh, observers. Um, I think that's a, a really important insight in this particular context. Um, it, the, the, the literature, as I understand it, on two-sided markets has been extremely illuminating. And it has given us a vocabulary and a conceptual way of thinking about the feedback effects between people on, uh, on both sides or entities on both sides of the platform. But that's just another way of talking about what was called the chicken and egg problem in the Microsoft case, in the indirect network. Um, I'm not saying there's nothing new. Catherine Tucker's work, which certainly suggests that it's not just uh, of the size of the network, but it's also some costs and switching costs and maybe market penetration that, that affect uh, the stickiness of, of those networks. Those are all the important insights that help people understand the next case involving a platform and help them decide, among other things, whether two-sidedness is material to the analysis of the conduct at issue. But I don't think they, they present us with a whole new conceptual framework that says, gee, let's just tear up the Microsoft decision and start over because we now understood the world doesn't work the way uh, it, it, we, all, we thought it worked. Uh, I think what's happened instead is the, the lights that we have to illuminate the world are a little brighter than they used to be. Sure, I'm going to uh, echo something Doug said, which is I think you can, as well as going forward, go, go backwards in the way you think about things. And I think there might be some evidence of that happening. Um, you know, to the credit of the Microsoft era uh, on the enforcement side, that some of this was already emphasized. Uh, people were very serious about inter-platform competition, uh, very serious about thinking about the competition in the entire market or even the entire industry. And uh, as part of that, thought carefully about the potential of, of Netscape as essentially a potential competitor. We didn't use that language, we didn't use that language, but in some ways we're thinking hard about the fact that, that uh, Netscape uh, might emerge as a, as, a, as a competitor on the platform uh, to the Microsoft operating browser. Uh, in recent, I think I want to contrast that with some of the, um, uh, not all this thinking is public, but some of it is, the thinking surrounding some of the mergers over the last 10 years in the, in the tech industry. I'll, I'll focus on uh, Facebook's acquisition of Instagram, for instance. If you think about Facebook acquiring Instagram, um, in fact, it, it has some uh, similarities um, in the sense that Instagram was uh, maybe not an active uh, competitor, at least a, a potential platform competitor to Facebook. Um, they, uh, it, it clearly was a situation where you would have inter-platform uh, competition. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, the FTC did a second request but uh, approved of the merger with no conditions. Um, the, uh, the analysis of that merger uh, by the uh, British uh, Office of, I, I can't remember what they're called, Office of Fair Competition. Fair Trading. I fair Trading or something yeah. is public. And if you look at it, it actually shows how two-sided market analysis can, can work, can, can work against you and, in fact, uh, act as a kind of a cage. Um, so the, the agency uh, looked, or the office looked at uh, the Facebook-Instagram merger. Uh, they concluded uh, that on one side of the market, because uh, on the advertising side of the market, because Instagram had not yet uh, started selling advertising, it was not competing with Facebook um, at all. And on the other side of the market, they decided that Facebook's uh, photo app was not uh, yet important enough to be a constraint on Instagram. And so they concluded that Facebook and Instagram were not actually competitors at all. Now, if you had that kind of thinking in the Microsoft case, I think uh, you know, it would have been entire. So in some ways, you can go backwards. You can get misled by, uh, in my view, I think it was a mistake to not take a more serious look at that merger. And in some ways, I think we can um, uh, too eagerly embrace new tools and get away from the bigger questions, which I think we were properly looking at uh, in the Microsoft era. 
Thanks very much. Uh, one last question on liability. It's the uh, chicken and egg problem that uh, Doug brought up. Uh, to what extent did Microsoft, uh, uh, by introducing DOS and Windows, solve that problem for the uh, program developers and uh, computer users? And did any of its alleged exclusionary conduct arguably serve those sorts of objectives? Uh, and then uh, how, if at all, does the Microsoft experience inform the assessment of claims by current platforms that their potentially exclusionary conduct is in fact needed to attract participants to one or the other side of the, of the platform? Well, I'll, I'll just say quickly that uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about, thinking about chicken and eggs. <clears throat> and um, just as a sidelight, if you were to read my econometrics textbook, I have a empirical example of, the, of which came first, the chicken or the eggs. And I <laughs> used uh, a re relatively sophisticated time series methods to conclude that we don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so my comments here will be similar in the, in the sense that uh, we were worried deeply about the chicken and egg problem, and I agree with Doug. It was really uh, thinking about two-sided markets, but I certainly didn't have enough sense to realize that I should be developing the theory much more deeply and uh, trying to sort out uh, the two sides uh, and, try and understanding the nature of the uh, feedback effects between what's happening on the developer side and, and what's happening on the uh, user side was, was the key to the case because that nature, that feedback effect is, is what was motivating uh, Microsoft and its behavior. And uh, I just want to say the, the facts that, that we focused on really are facts that really got at the issue of, of how important uh, that chicken and egg problem was. Uh, and it wasn't until we really looked deeply at the facts that we understood that, uh, this two, that there was a two-level entry problem here, and that, that created a really huge uh, buried entry, uh, I think that would typify why the uh, network effects in this case, in the, in the Microsoft case, were quite different than some of the network effects we see in other markets, which are more localized. Susan, would you like? Sure. So um, I, don't, I don't know who, who came first, the chicken or the egg, or, or uh, Windows or, or app developers, but um, Sort of more generally, I think it, it's awfully important, as that chicken and egg problem suggests, to be when you're trying to figure out kind of what are the business executives up to, um, to be looking at sort of business practices in light of their effects on both sides of the platform. And I think sometimes that gets misunderstood as sounding um, like it's uh, sort of a defense move, but I, but I actually think it's 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 just as likely to cause you to miss things sort of for under enforcement as as for over enforcement so just like as a, on an under enforcement um, example so uh, David Evans who spoke here yesterday and I worked on behalf of Netflix um, on the Time Warner um, Comcast proposed uh, acquisition and people were tending to, you know sort of the justification for the deal was that since the companies operated as uh, local cable systems but never in the same zip code, there was, on the user side, there was no overlap, so how could there possibly be a problem? But if you actually, but if you looked at it as a two-sided market, since those same cable systems also provide, were multi-channel video distribution providers, they connected households with video programming providers, like, for example, Netflix. Um, and so if you, if, if you focused just on, well, gee, we're just you know, gaining scale on the user side, you would have missed what would have been a hypothetical, you know, sort of a hypothesized competitive harm from the deal that this was actually about increasing the merging party's ability to um, extract um, uh, more market power over the other half of the uh, other side of the platform, um, like video providers, which I think is in fact what uh, DOJ and the FCC ended up concluding when they challenged uh, the deal. So. Conversely, I think um, a failure to recognize um, sort of that how business practices may be needed for sort of chicken and egg issues um, is a, a prominent example in the uh, recent Microsoft Android decision about um, that, that I, uh, I think that the EC missed. So at issue in that case was a restriction that prohibited OEMs from introducing incompatibilities it would cause fragmentation and drive app developers out of the, off the platform. Now, I think if you 
bring a Microsoft analysis to bear and say, well, gee, why would a platform provider want to, you know, sort of prevent practices that would drive app developers off the platform? It's not very hard to think about why that might be a, a legitimate concern by uh, a platform operator. But since the EC basically defined the, mar the relevant market as being Instead of um, and instead of the chicken and egg end users and app developers, they define the relevant customers as being OEMs, um, and so effectively app developers have kind of disappeared entirely from the analysis. So, I think if you so getting it getting those dynamics right and understanding sort of how business practices might be interrelating help, can help you both understand kind of when you should and when you shouldn't be. Uh, Challenging particular practices. Thanks. I think we'd have about two to three minutes more on this on this subject, Randy. So, so the answer to which came first, the chicken or the egg? The answer is IBM came first. So, and what I mean by that is, is recall how the IBM PC is released and what that means for Microsoft. IBM decides they're going to build a PC. They don't have a chip. They don't have an operating system. They don't have languages. IBM goes to Microsoft and says, "Can you give us the languages you have?" Microsoft says yes. IBM then turns to them and says, can you give us an operating system? And Microsoft says, oh, you should go down the road and talk to Gary Kildall. We don't have one of those. Okay. So at the point where Microsoft is being offered a key to the future kingdom of the PC, they say no. Um, and when the IBM PC is released, it's released with three operating systems, not one. So I don't know that Microsoft solved anything. And I, I think Gates and Allen did a great job of getting into languages at the right time. And when the language deal was going to die, then they scrambled to sort of buy an operating system from somebody, and that's what happened. Don't also forget the competition as we move from DOS to the world of the GUI. There is robust, interesting competition there. IBM has top view and eventually PS2 and OS2. The first time they're sort of released to build the system they want to build, they built the 1981 machine with the pending 1969 antitrust suit, and that clearly influenced what they did there. So I don't want to overstate what Microsoft did. Leo or Tim? Um, I was thinking about lessons from Microsoft in light of this panel and what I would draw from it. I, I, I don't want to insult anyone who was with the DOJ at the time or, or Microsoft or the court, but I think, you know, one lesson that I took from it um, is the importance of thinking everything through carefully, all of the elements of the claim, and it was a marathon. I mean, it was such a large case with so many um, different pieces. and. You know, from, from my perspective, it seemed like at some point everyone ran out of steam. And maybe that's inevitable, but, you know, on the attempted monopolization, the DOJ's failure to allege a browser market or Microsoft offering justifications for its conduct that it didn't substantiate at all, or mm -hmm. where they did substantiate certain things, the government failing to come back and say, that's ridiculous, that's pretextual, you know. Um, it was a really big case, a massive record, and I think, you know, a lot of litigators did an excellent job on it, but there were so many pieces. It, it, it just seemed like um, important elements of claims got uh, got lost in the shuffle. And I think by the time they got to the remedy phase, everybody, including the court, was just completely out of energy. Um, <laughs> so it's um, something to think about, I think, in these big cases. Give me one more. More minute. If I zoom, I think also why this is almost the exact opposite perspective. Well, you, well, you look uh, at the individual uh, moves that made the anti uh, the, the uh, Microsoft case. It's always also very important to look at uh, Microsoft in the context of a big trilogy of cases: IBM, um, AT and T, uh, and and uh, Microsoft and Microsoft, which effectively were the um, uh, United States' uh, tech policy yeah. for, for, for almost 20 or 30 years um, and, and had, I think, really substantial effects. Uh, and this stuff is very hard to, you know, it's all anecdote. How do we prove that uh, how much of, you know, the big boom in, in tech and the return to American dominance was, had to do with these three antitrust cases? Well, well they didn't stop it, <laughs> put it that way. 
Um, and uh, you know, in each of them, in each of those cases, you know, there was there was a, a policy which uh, you know was really the policy of the Sherman Act, which is uh, we're concerned that uh, uh, that monopoly can act as a narcotic. Uh, we're concerned that uh, with, with stagnant markets, we're interested in uh, the overarching uh, uh, question of innovation in these industries. Um, now, those aren't legal tests, but they're 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 policy. And I, I think it's as we examine this, it's very important not only look at the 5,000, but also the 100,000 foot view of, of what is the U.S. doing in antitrust, uh, doing in tech policy, and also to contrast that and ask what are we doing now. Thanks. I'd like now to uh, move to uh, a few remedy questions. We uh, had both the, the specifics of the remedy and uh, also the overall effect of the uh, government case. So uh, f looking first at the remedy orders, uh, th there was both the uh, structural remedy that the district court imposed and that was then uh, reversed by the uh, Court of Appeals, and then there was a, uh, a settlement uh, ad adopted on remand. Uh, how effective and appropriate were the various proposed remedies, such as the structural separation of Windows Office and uh, of Microsoft Office and Windows, uh, and the consent decree? It was design relief complicated by the difficulty of predicting the extent to which Microsoft's market power would have been undermined absent its exclusionary conduct? And in light of the experience of Microsoft, how should courts approach designing injunctive relief to remedy concerns that a dominant platform has enhanced its market power by illegally excluding a nascent competitor? Uh, Randy, you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think in I know there's going to be a panel on, on EU and US. I, I do think when you think about remedy in the Microsoft situation, you should look at sort of the two iterations of the US remedy, and then the two remedies we saw in the EU with regard to Windows Media Player, uh, and then the, the browser choice or browser ballot with regard to Internet Explorer. Uh, on the US side, I, I think the conceptual question you want to ask is, I, I think you always want to ask this in an antitrust case or in a, in a class is, had we implemented the remedy at the beginning, would it have prevented the behavior from happening, right? So if that's what the structural remedy is supposed to do, would it have worked in that but-for world? And if you'd split Microsoft into an OS company and an office company, let's say, I think the OS company would have still had the same incentives to protect its monopoly vis-a-vis -vis Netscape. So in that sense, I think that's a conceptual remedy that doesn't seem to work. I'm, I'm completely with Leah in her sense that people got tired, and, and, and that you get this remedy. Now, I can't tell if the remedy in the US was effective for the reasons Tim gave earlier, which is this policeman thing, right? right? Maybe that is, right? Why didn't Microsoft not go after Google in a powerful way? That's a really, really important question. I think we're sort of all guessing in the dark on that. On the two EU remedies, if I could just mention those briefly, as you'll recall what happens there uh, with regard to Windows Media Player, uh, the, the EC is willing to say to Microsoft, you have to create versions of Windows with and without the media player, but you don't have to charge different prices for those. Um, and um, I wrote a paper before they did that saying I thought that was a sensible remedy. It has to be seen, I think, in many ways, based on what we know from a public standpoint, is a complete failure. They sell 35 million <laughs> copies of XP with and 1,787 without. Uh, and then on the browser ballot, as you'll recall, what happens there is, is Microsoft is running, is rolling out Windows 7. The EU jumps in and says, oh, we don't want you to, to tie Internet Explorer to Windows. Microsoft cuts a deal where in the Europe, when you turned on a computer um, the first time, you would be presented with a choice of 14 different browsers. Uh, and given that the U.S. case was litigated on the premise that having two buttons was confusing, both Internet Explorer and Navigator, I think the only conclusion from that is, is the Europeans are just a lot smarter than United States citizens. So, or maybe the market had evolved or something. But that remedy was something of a failure as well, in the sense that uh, Microsoft breaks the browser ballot um, when they release Service Pack 1 for Windows 7, and no one seems to notice for 17 months. I just want to uh, comment uh, on one aspect of what Randy said, which is the conceptual basis for the proposed divestiture remedy uh, in the Microsoft case. So let's, let's back up. Microsoft is about, is about protecting markets for competition so that uh, we don't have to have regulation. We can allow uh, competitors to discipline firms in the market. 
So in that context, it seems to me structural remedies are at least presumptively superior to conduct remedies. Okay, there are four purposes for a remedy in antitrust. One's compensation, rarely used for equitable remedies, although you can have restitution or something. One is to stop the illegal conduct, that's fairly straightforward. The third is to prevent the recurrence of the illegal conduct, and that raises a very, often a very difficult question of the level of generality or con uh, 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 abstraction at which you want to describe the wrongdoing. So was the, was the wrongdoing in Microsoft doing in competing browsers? Was it doing in um, uh, uh, middleware alternatives? Was it doing a, a, a away with any kind of platform software with APIs or any operating system complements, any of which could, by some you know, logic, have um, uh, been seen as, as facilitators of, uh, of competing operating systems? So that was a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, uh, issue if the government had gone in that way in, in its initial proposal. The guts of the initial proposal, however, was addressed to a different remedial purpose, which is restoring competition that was damaged by the, by the uh, uh, conduct found to be illegal. So the, the theory of the divestiture remedy was not that the operating system's motives or incentives would be any different if there were a divestiture, but that um, the owner of office would have a different incentive to license and port office to competing operating systems rather than refrain from doing so for fear that those operating systems would grow into competitive threats to Microsoft. So I think it was conceptually a coherent and sensible remedy addressed to the idea that, that, that uh, entry barriers had been raised by Microsoft and, and we were now looking for a strategy to lower them. The problem um, uh, is uh, that no one knew the facts. We didn't know uh, what would happen uh, if there were a divestiture, and we didn't have any clue about the costs of breaking up Microsoft in that way. We had some outside experts who opined, but what we didn't have was discovery. And frankly, I think the, the judge, and maybe Leah's right, just tired at the end of all this, <laughs> the judge peremptory decision to enter the order and order divestiture without discovery, without any, any kind of process, I mean, it was just an, an outrage, <laughs> maybe, um, completely inexcusable. Uh, but but um, uh, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that there was a, coher a conceptually coherent remedy story in that proposed divestiture. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I just uh, want to add, I, I agree with uh, everything Doug said, perhaps not surprisingly. I just want to add a couple other things to that. Uh, first of all, I actually do think there is a role for, uh, for conduct remedies in general, uh, and there was a small role here, but, I, but this is one case where, in my view, a structural remedy was essential for some of the reasons Doug described, and uh, <clears throat> I, just, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, 20 years ago thinking, along with quite a few others, about exactly what would happen uh, if we imposed this aggressive structural remedy. And uh, I, I came to the belief that we would see, uh, as Doug suggested, uh, the apps folks who had a strong uh, office suite uh, looking to contract with other operating systems. It's not all that hard to generate an operating system. The hard part is finding the apps that will support it. So I actually felt very strongly at the time we would see new competition. <clears throat> and, uh, and the remedy had some appeal. Uh, like Doug, I was... Uh, uh, Disappointed, actually, and, and regret and perhaps not being more outspoken about the need to ask Judge Jackson to listen to our plan for extensive discovery on the remedies. We did have several experts. There were two economists, <clears throat> uh, one of whom just won a Nobel Prize, uh, who were prepared to testify about exactly what would happen in that world. And I believe that the, uh, that the uh, concern about having complementary uh, assets, the advantage of having complementary assets within a single uh, firm would not be lost with a remedy that had this, the firm broken up. I thought there were contractual solutions to that which would work quite, effect, quite effectively. Well, we never got to, heard that, to hear that discovery, and I think that was unfortunate. Um, sure, I just figured I'd touch on the consent decree briefly since that's the remedy we all got stuck with. Um, it was a really weak, bad decree, but it, it, I think it was important, and maybe it goes to Tim's point about the policeman, but I, I think it also, it meant that Microsoft had 
it had violated the antitrust laws. It had a track record. So this was, the consent decree was no longer the baseline antitrust laws. It was an additional layer on top of that, um, taking into the account the fact that Microsoft had um, cut off the air supply of its competitors. It had affirmatively misled uh, Java developers in order to maintain its monopoly. And so it got um, the DOJ, the states, the technical committee, um, all looking over it, and also, of course, the European Commission. Um, I do think the decree played an important role in the growth of a new generation of platforms. I think, you know, the new generation of companies read the case, they read the Microsoft case, and they, you know, they read the decree to understand what protections they had, but I think they also read it, um, you know, to understand where the rules of competition are. I think the case showed the importance of focusing on building better products and if a company is really focused on the user and delivering a better experience, that is competition on the merits and that should come through. Um, so I think it, it created guidelines for a whole new group of, of companies and it also meant that Microsoft could not uh, go back to using the same tactics that it had been using. So um, as badly written as that decree was, I think the whole, the whole process was, was meaningful. Yes. So. Um, let me speak a little bit about the policeman at the elbow <laughs> theory, because I, I think it's uh, sort of overlooked um, sometimes because it's so informal. But I, I, I do th uh, think if you look at the uh, carefully at the history uh, after Microsoft and uh, some of, also uh, some of what happened during the IBM case, um, uh, you know, you have remedies that were not as what we would usually call, I mean, they were conduct remedies in a way. But I think the most important factor was that they offered a credible threat of the uh, antitrust litigation starting again, or the idea that you were being watched uh, on parole, and so, as, as, you, as you put it. And um, I, I think that um, the fact that Microsoft changed its conduct uh, is, is, and, and didn't engage in some of what would be the most obvious uh, uses of its explorer monopoly uh, is important. Um, you know, it had, uh, as I said earlier, it managed to gain a, a monopoly. It, it succeeded in monopolizing uh, the browser market. And from that vantage point, had uh, all sorts of opportunities uh, to do what had been its previous business practices. Um, but it, it didn't uh, for various uh, reasons. But mainly, I think, uh, I think the, that maybe it's not the only explanation, but I think the most straightforward explanation is that it was afraid of uh, restarting uh, antitrust. So I, I think everyone, uh, you know, in terms of lessons from Microsoft, I should be thinking about how you create that policeman at the elbow effect if you have a convicted uh, lawbreaker uh, like Microsoft was. Um, on the, uh, I like the separation, uh, sorry, the uh, structural remedy and the divestiture remedy uh, for slightly uh, different reasons, a uh, little, maybe a little disconnected from antitrust, but having to do with innovation policy. Um, you know, I've said earlier, stressed earlier that the history of innovation uh, in, in the United States is often uh, and in the tech industries, is centered on uh, platforms and success, successful platforms. I don't deny that sometimes integration can uh, be a part of that. But um, one, one thing I think you saw after uh, the Microsoft, sort of the failure of the Microsoft case, is you continued uh, with, with a situation where the operating system was basically, in the view of industry, in the view of, uh, of investors and, and entrepreneurs, a, a hopeless place to, to innovate, a, a dangerous place. Um, and so you never really had, until much, much later, the birth of serious competitors to the office suite, um, and even much, much later, serious competitors to, uh, to explore. Now, they showed up eventually, uh, I think thanks to the good work of the Microsoft case uh, in, in making the, the browser itself an important platform that people innovated on, but you did have this, uh, I don't know what you call it, dead weight or, or lost uh, years uh, where we were all uh, uh, presented with Word is the only option for a very long, long time. And I realize that didn't necessarily connect exactly to the reason for bringing the Microsoft case, but I think ended up being uh, important. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I want to uh, pose one uh, last question uh, uh, for a quick response, and it's uh, one about the more broadly the impact of the Microsoft case. And uh, Tim's discussion of the elbow eff uh, effect is uh, certainly one uh, uh, striking example of it. To what extent did the government action, apart from the relief awarded, 
inhibit Microsoft from using its market, market power? To what extent did, it, did the case ex, uh, advance Section 2 law in ways that uh, help deter exclusionary conduct by dominant IT firms in the future? And, and did the case uh, uh, compare or complement the legal actions either by the EU or by the private lawsuits? Uh, and how has this uh, affected subsequent developments in the IT industry? Uh, uh, Doug, did you want to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. Uh, it, it, it seemed to me that there were two problems the case uh, uh, was, uh, was addressing. One was the Microsoft problem. What do you do about desktop operating system competition? Uh, and I think a lot of people thought that that train had pretty much left the station in terms at least of the browser as, as a facilitator of new entry. And the other was the antitrust problem, which is what are we going to do to make the antitrust law effective uh, as a policeman, if not at the elbow, at least, you know, uh, up in the sky watching um, uh, Microsoft and other big firms. Uh, and I, I saw at the time and, and continue to think that the most important contribution of the Microsoft case was on the latter point as a law clarification and law uh, revitalization uh, uh, success. Uh, and uh, I leave to those who know more about the tech industry than I to argue whether the remedy actually was material to subsequent developments uh, in uh, uh, computer technology competition. Thanks. Uh, we have about a minute more if uh, people, other people want to. Well, I just wanted to agree with uh, Doug and Leah about the importance of uh, the decision as a, as a precedential guide. I think that um, was really quite important because it can be lost that, that it's important to be able to give um, you know, pr practicing lawyers um, a clear, clear roadmap about what's, what works and what doesn't work and when they're advising uh, companies. And I thought micro an important part of Microsoft's success was doing that, that it's been a, a clear benchmark for us. I was just going to add one thing. For, uh, for me, uh, there was an important lesson for people who do get involved in these investigations. The economists and the lawyers work together from beginning to end, and we all agreed that economic theory, wonderful as it is, only gets you halfway there. You really need to apply the theory to the facts of the case from day one, and that's what we did. Thanks very much. Uh, we now have, uh, I think, maybe a minute and a half left for our uh, closing statements. I, I, I think uh, Tim and Leah may have started theirs uh, based on a uh, what, what I had earlier uh, said, but I, uh, I would ask uh, each, each panelist to uh, uh, keep the, uh, uh, the uh, closing uh, remarks short, please. Uh, and starting, starting with uh, Tim. Oh, starting with me. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I, I did actually start on it, which is I do uh, believe that uh, it's important to take the 100,000-foot uh, view and think about um, these big cases as part of broader uh, parts of, frankly, American tech and innovation policy. And, um, you know, I think Microsoft was the uh, third and what ultimately, although people dispute at the time, ended up being a very successful trilogy of big cases. And I hope the lesson the FTC takes um, and other trust enforcers take is one that does prioritize the big view that thinks of uh, innovation as working in long cycles and uh, uh, under, uh, thinks hard about what it takes um, uh, to, to provide uh, those nudges or effective uh, supervision, policemen at the elbow, other effects that uh, have um, meant so much for the health of the American economy. I'll just add that I think a, a really important part of the case was the um, focus on effect on competition and the fact that the plaintiff needs to meet a burden of showing harm to competition at the outset. Um, the court emphasized that Section 2 is not about intent. Microsoft clearly had the, um, the intent to crush its competitors, but what the court really looked at was the effect of that conduct, and um, some of the conduct also had that effect. So I think that um, legacy with a focus on competitive effects is important. Um, so, so I, I guess I want to echo what Dan and Doug just said. I mean, I think that um, these kinds of set situations are incredibly complex and tricky, and it means that there needs to be uh, repeated uh, uh, iteration between economics, law, and the facts, 
Um, and um, I, I think Microsoft's an incredibly successful example of that. I do think that means that it's less about grand theories of antitrust, so we're sort of in the midst of a discussion about that. Is consumer welfare good, bad? Uh, I can answer, I can so decide the Microsoft case without reaching that, that level, uh, and I think uh, that's probably the right way to go on that. Yeah, so I was going to go to the 100,000 foot level too, but maybe somewhat different from Tim, um, which is, I think if you if you look at sort of the what were the big benchmarks for people advising tech companies in the tech industry? Um, there was the Microsoft case, which I've indicated obviously, I think was provided a balanced and coherent analytical framework. And conversely, there were the IBM peripherals cases, which um, you know, as Randy indicated, IBM won every single one of those. And so I think between the two of them, that pro has provided um, American technology with a really a nice framework about kind of what is permissible and what isn't. And the, you know, if you step back, um, kind of how, how is American competition uh, doing globally today? I'd say you see a lot of American companies competing intensely amongst each other with a lot of other uh, innovative companies, particularly in China. Um, you know, there are certainly sectors where American companies are not in the lead. I think in China they're probably leading artificial intelligence, for example, but American companies are probably in the lead on things like 5G. So, you know, having been in the industry for a long time, nowhere do I see the kind of sleepy complacency or bags over the head that I saw with, at the time of the Wintel duopoly. Um, and just, you know, to, to by contrast, maybe somewhat differing and disagreeing with Tim a little bit here, you know, I think during that same 40-year period, we've seen a lot more intervention from uh, Europe consistently. Um, and that, you know, sort of the interventionist trend has only increased, I'd say, in recent years. Um, and during that same period, we've also seen um, sort of a receding rather than increasing of, of the role of European technology companies generally. So for those, I think, who'd be saying um, sort of that more is necessarily better, I think we'd, we'd need to, you know, sort of we should be having a more European style of protecting edge companies, for example, even at the cost of uh, weakening productive integration and platform competition. I think it would seem to me that the burden should be on those advocating for that kind of change that um, to show it's not reasonable to expect that in the event they're successful, we'd see an accompanying dim diminution in American competitiveness as well. I'm struck by how often in this conversation we have referred to the unmeasurable and the unobservable. Uh, no one knows what the price effects were of, of the conduct we've been talking about. We've talked about innovation, but no one really knows when innovation would have taken place but for the brawl for the conduct. Um, uh, uh, we've talked about entry barriers, but no one knows what the entry would have been. Uh, we talked about the unknowns and, and, and so forth, the unknown competitors. Uh, what's striking to me is that those who say antitrust law can deal only with bread and butter price cases or, or where we have uh, readily observable and measurable variables, I think are wrong. And Microsoft demonstrates that the, that the basic principles of antitrust, is the conduct efficiency based or not, did it tend to reduce the, the discipline of rivals in the future, um, are robust enough to deal with facts uh, even where we don't have some of the traditional uh, observable variables. So just say I agree with Doug, absolutely. And uh, thanks to Bill for, for doing a great job moderating all of us. It wasn't easy. Well, thanks. This was a privilege. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking our panel.